What is going on? Welcome back to another episode of It's a Blast podcast. My name's Mike, also known as the EOD Happy Captain on X. If you like the content that I'm producing, please like, subscribe, and follow along. Today, I'm sitting down with a military legend, Sergeant Major Mike Vining, an EOD technician and one of the founding members of Delta Force. Let's get started. Welcome to the It's a Blast podcast. My name is Mike. Here, I talk to members of the veteran and military community about their leadership style and how the military has affected their lives. Let's get started. What is going on? I am sitting down with Sergeant Major Retired Mike Vine, a Vietnam War veteran, EOD technician, and one of the founding members of Delta Force. Sir, how are you doing today? Yeah, I'm doing great, Mike. Thank you for your podcast. I'm looking forward to the next uh, hour or how long it is. Yeah, no, uh, really excited to have you here. So, you know, one of the things that I like to do on this show is talk to veterans, members of the active duty military community, kind of talk to them about their leadership style and, and their careers. And you, without a doubt, have had a very storied career. You are probably one of the most prolific people when we talk about uh, the meme generation, right? You are one of those people that when your face is seen, everybody knows who you are. But I kind of want to start it out, you know, talking about your background, right? And so, you know, you obviously didn't start as a Delta Force operator. Uh, and so can you kind of tell me what is it that made you want to join the Army in the first place? Well, you know, I, when I, even when I was a little kid, uh, I, I knew that, that I would eventually go into the military. You know, I would, I'd get these at Christmas time. What I would want at Christmas time, like I had an Alamo, an Alamo play set. I had a Civil War play set that I would, um, and different other military things and read about the military. And my dad, uh, you know, was, he, he was Navy during World War II. He was uh, a gunner's mate, a 20 millimeter gunner on an LST. Uh, and, you know, all, all my relatives were served in the military. I had one in the Marine. My, grand, great, my great grandfather was a Marine um uh, air force so come from not a career military family but they did their time and so when you came in was you know did you know what you want to do in the military when you first came in <laughs> yeah my first thing i wanted to do was you know the old 10th mountain division the the mountain troops and the ski troops that's what I really would have wanted to do because I, I like climbing. You know, I, when I was a teenager, when I was 16, I went out to the Tetons in Wyoming, Jackson, Wyoming. And I went to a mountaineering school at the age of 16, which was the minimum age you could do this at. And so I read climbing books and, you know, I liked the old 10th mountain division, but in night in the 1960s, uh, mountain the 10th mountain division didn't exist uh there were no mountain troops in the military and uh my second choice was eod i had seen a movie a film world war ii during the battle of britain when germany was bombing britain and one of these large bombs uh like a satan type bomb had penetrated down into a subterranean cavern in London, someplace in London, and a British bomb disposal officer all by himself went down there and removed and defused uh, the bomb. And I thought, God, you know, I thought that was amazing, the courage it would take to walk down there by yourself and to uh, defuse this bomb. Uh, just like I was, it amazed me. So I wanted to go into second choice was EOD because there was no climbing. Uh, be a mountain troop. Uh, so, but I couldn't go into EOD directly. It would, you, know, you could not enlist for EOD. So my recruiter said that he recommended I go into ammunition renovation, the maintenance of ammunition 
And from there, I can volunteer for, after you get an AIT and MOS, you can go to EOD. You, washout rate was so high in EOD that you had to have an MOS prior to going to EOD school. So if you washed out, you, they could immediately reassign you. You're not sent to another AIT. Uh, so I did that. And, uh, and of course, back then, fit, ammunition renovation, uh, 55 Charlie, uh, we disposed of code H ammunition. It wasn't EOD that disposed of unserviceable uh, ammunition. It was the 55 Charlies. But we were taught by the EOD there at Redstone. So we went out to the EOD range and we were taught the art of destroying unserviceable ammunition. And of course, the first thing they always did was ask for volunteers. So I immediately volunteered and, and did my interview there at Redstone. And so I went right from uh, Redstone to phase one, uh, which was the chemical bio phase, which at that time was at Fort McCollin, Alabama. It was two weeks down there. Uh, a colonel, a chem also back then, chemical corps officers also attended EOD school. A lot of chemical corps officers did. And so the school was run by Colonel Templeton, and he was a chemical corps EOD officer. And uh, there, then from there, I went to the phase two at Indian Head, Maryland, the Naval Ordnance Station. And uh, and did that's where I did the surface part. Uh, we had a chemical corps officer in our class, a captain, and going through EOD school. And unbeknownst to me, he recommended two of us in the class to go to tech escort. So after I graduated, I was I I was only um, a PFC. I was. 18 years old when I graduated, graduated from EOD school as a PFC. So I wasn't eligible to go through nukes. So I went to tech escort. And when I was in tech escort, then I made E4. And I went back to Indian Head to the nuke phase. And uh, from tech escort, I volunteered for Vietnam. I put in three requests for Vietnam. My company commander kept disapproving them, but finally on the third time, I, he gave up. That was Colonel Dean Dickey. Amazing man. Uh, I, were, I now enjoyed my time in tech escort. You know, I, I wanted to be in a regular EOD unit, but I learned a lot of things in tech escort that I, I value to this day. And so for those... For those people that don't know what tech escort is, can you kind of explain what a technical escort unit is uh, within EOD and chemical? Yeah, so it's a mixed unit that was at Edgewood Arsenal. We had a detachment uh, out at Rocky Mountain Arsenal in, just outside of Denver. And so tech escort's a mix of chemical co core people and EOD people. And of course, at Edgewood, we had a regular EOD unit, the 149th that uh, Edgewood. And so if we had it in tech escort, if we had, even though we were EOD and we had an EOD problem, we had to call the 149th to take care of it. it I didn't make any sense to me. Uh, tech escort, we escorted chemical shipments, hazardous chemical agents. And at the time we also escorted biological agent um, shipments too, small plane, uh, just moving these bio, biological agents around the country to different labs and stuff like that. And, and another th mission that Tech Escort had, of course, get, getting rid of all the, the stockpile of chemical munitions that we had in World War II, we did, uh, we did a lot of sea dumping in the Atlantic Ocean operation through Operation Chase until that became a, illegal. And, President Nixon also said that we could not have an offensive biological uh, mission, so it's just the defensive. So that that kind of changed our mission. But uh, yeah, so the uh, that we did stuff. I would go to the toxic gas yard 
you know, in the morning, pick up all these chemical agents that were at, you know, uh, I pick up a gallon of hydrogen cyanide in, in a in a glass jug that was frozen, you know, and I put it in a, a container full of ice and then drive it over to the lab um, and pick stuff up and bring it back. So we escorted stuff like that. Um, the aerial mines during Vietnam, during the McNamara thing, one of the things that we had was these aerial mines or called gravel mines that um, they were basically a small aerial drop mine that has a lead azide charge in them. But to render them safe, they, they were in Freon. So they were encased in this uh, container with Freon and they were shipped over to Vietnam by, by both ship and by air. And we had to escort those shipments um, and we would have alarms. If a pressure, a Freon pressure alarm went off, we then would have to inject Freon back into the thing because Freon kept the lead azide safe. Uh, and these were scattered. So we escorted those shipments and did that kind of stuff. I can't imagine. I mean, and it's also interesting the way things come full circle, right? So, you know, uh, so 55 Charlie into 55 Delta, the, the previous ammo to EOD MOSs no longer exist. You know, now we're 89 Deltas. But when I went through EOD school, I was the very first year where it was no longer required where you could organically go EOD. Um, but before that, you had to be an 89 Bravo, an ammunition specialist, and then you'd go to EOD school. Um, and now, of mm-hmm. course, when we talk about our officers coming through EOD school, uh, before it was straight ordnance officers. You were an ordnance officer, you went to the basic officer course, and then you went to EOD school. Um, and then in the last two years, we have started allowing for engineer corps and chemical corps officers to come back in. Uh, you know, one question I do want to ask is, you, we're talking about a time frame. you're volunteering for, for Vietnam. Uh, and so you're a volunteer in the Army during the draft. You know, what... What is that like when we talk? Obviously, EOD is an all volunteer MOS, uh, but once you get downrange to you know Vietnam, what is that like working with people who have volunteered to be at war, but also with those who are not there willingly? Yeah, well, yeah, EOD is like you said it was all volunteer, and my whole purpose going into the military, you know, when I was a senior in high school was 1968. That was the Tet offense. That was the big thing. And, you know, the people, the war protest was going on and all that kind of stuff. But half, most of the people that were protesting or talking had no idea what they were talking about. They had no firsthand experience. You know, I wanted to go over to and see what was going on for Vietnam for myself. And um, that my goal was to go to the to Vietnam. So I, so I went there and, um, so it was the rule of thumb, uh, too. There was a rule of thumb for that. We did not send graduates from EOD school right to Vietnam. It was an unwritten rule that you at least spend a year in an EOD unit before you would go over to Vietnam to get some more, more experience. Towards the end of the war, we did have uh, guys coming right from EOD school to Vietnam. But I, I do think that, uh, the, and I don't think it was necessary to send people to Vietnam. I think that we had enough bodies that we didn't need to do that. I think it's good to, to spend a year in a regular EOD unit before you go into a combat zone. Um, and so I went to the 99th Ordnance Detachment EOD. And back then the Ordnance Detachment was 10 people. And uh, so in Vietnam, how we did it is that, you know, we had about 13 EOD, Army EOD units in Vietnam. I think at one time we had 15 counting the control detachment. But uh, we divided Vietnam up into geographical areas. We, we weren't assigned to a particular unit. We were assigned to, like I was signed at Phuc Vinh, which was 1st Cavs 
Division uh, Rear Headquarters. But we supported all of first, the 99th supported all first CAVS operations, part of the 1st Infantry Division before they left Vietnam. Um, and the 199th Light Infantry Brigade and the 11th Armored Cavalry Re Regiment. So any of these units that required our assistance, and we operated in the northwest corner of three corps, northwest of Saigon, up against the Cambodian border. And that was a particularly hot spot during the 70s um, there. Uh, because from Cambodia was the direct link to Saigon. You know, and so we were between Cambodia and Saigon. Uh, and also what we did in EOD in Vietnam is that we had on-site teams. So we we had either one or two on-site teams. And like in our unit, we had one on-site team. When I first got there, it was at a place called Quan Loi. This way we could be, be more forward and to better support. And with these on-site teams was two men. And we did two weeks, two weeks on, and then we would go back to the unit and go and do two weeks. And what we did was we overlap our two weeks. So when I went to Quan, the on-site team at Quan Loi, the EOD tech that I relieved, there was one that had been there for already a week. So we do this one, you know, these overlaps so that we keep the, you know, what's going on in the, in the area. And, um, Basically, in Vietnam, we operated in two-man teams, mostly. Uh, only when there was an ammo dump that blew up uh, or some big cache like Rock Island East or Warehouse Hill did we have more EOD folks to support that. But most of the time, we were just operating two people and constantly yeah. out. Uh, 11 months in Vietnam, I went on 380 EOD incidents. It's incredible. Uh, you know, one, I think one question that has come up is we just spent the last 20 years, uh, the global war on terror has, has come to a close. I'm an Afghanistan veteran. I know there's a lot of people listening, uh, you know, that, that did the global war on terror, uh, from an EOD perspective, you know, we're starting to make the transition back over from counterinsurgency to large scale combat operations. Uh, and so I think, you know, there's a lot of similarities probably with, with what you did in Vietnam and where we're heading, you know, should we go to a near peer fight down the road? And so I guess one of the questions is, can you kind of tell uh, people that are listening or watching, what was the average day as an EOD tech? I mean, over, you know, close to 400 incidents that you ran, what were those types of incidents? Some of them were comical. <laughs> Um, and, uh, uh, some of them are just bizarre, uh, had a M7, he had an M79 40 millimeter grenade launcher with a 40 millimeter, uh, stuck in the round in the tube on the green line. Uh, so we go out there, go out to the bunker where this, uh, this happened. And sure enough, it's just the 40 millimeters just smashed into the thing. So trying to figure out what happened. So the soldier decided that, uh, you know, they, we do what we call mad minutes in Vietnam. All of a sudden, you know, you just for it's you open up and just shoot in case anybody's out there and just see if you can stir anything up. And it's called a mad minute. So this guy took one of these uh, flares, hand flares, you know, those slap type flares. He decided to take a flare put it in the barrel of the weapon, put a 40 millimeter HE round in it, and he was going to shoot it, and he watched the flare come out, and then the 40 millimeter falling behind it. Well, the flare went out, but the 40 millimeter stuck in the tube, and I guess it had a pretty good kick. Uh, they just get bored, you know, it's just bo bored being on the perimeter and doing stuff like that. Had an 81 millimeter mortar with a stuck in the tube and so we go out there and we're looking at the barrel it, it's out there you know outside the perimeter the 81 millimeter mortar and there's a clob of dirt in the barrel of the 81 millimeter mortar no wonder the 81 millimeter mortar tubes like what happened so 
And we had these 524 fuses in Vietnam, which were notorious. That you would pull the the arming wire out of them. Sometimes they would arm just by pulling the the arming wire out, and you couldn't put the arming wire back in. So they so what they had done is they took the 81 millimeter mortar tube and tied a rope to it and threw it over a tree. And what they were doing is they were pulling it back and dropping the tube down into the ground to dislodge the 81 millimeter mortar and it just plugged it up with dirt. So, you know, we got the dirt out and we fished, we fished it out. We got the mortar out, but we told them the next time you do this, we're just going to blow the mortar and tube up. It, um, it's crazy to me that no matter how much, uh, time goes by and things change. They actually stay the same, right? Because you're, you're telling the story about the guy with the, the 40. Uh, we were in Afghanistan and we get a knock on the door and there's this E7 standing there, the Sergeant First Class, and he's holding, you know, a PG-7, a rocket propelled grenade, but it's missing the standoff cone. And he hands it to me. Uh, and, and, I, and we, haven't, we haven't left the wire. We haven't gone outside the base in probably two days due to weather. Right. And he hands it to me and he goes, I found this. And I, I look at him and I go, where did you find it? Right. Because no one's left the base in two days. So, you know, where did you find it? And so the story starts coming out. Right. Uh, they had found it two days ago, you know, out in sector and they picked it up and it's fired. I mean, it's, it's pretty dangerous. It's got a base detonating fuse in it. Um, and I said, well, what have you been doing with it for two days? And they were using it as a baseball bat, they were throwing rocks and someone would hit it. And, and I said, okay, well, well, why are you bringing it to me now? And he said, well, it's the damnedest thing is I hit a rock with it and I felt something inside go, you know, we're, we're, we're at word up. Right. Uh, and so I'd like, I'd like you to have this. Right. And so, you know, <laughs> the story that you're telling, it's, it's like soldiers are the same. They're, they were the same as they, as they will ever be. Uh, and they're always going to do silly stuff and it's always gonna you know involve eod support unfortunately and that was a good outcome because you know we disposed of it uh we were pretty upset at the time we had a pretty good laugh but you know talking about uh ordinance right rock island east let's talk about that because that is uh to my understanding one of the biggest caches found during the war yeah it was the largest enemy ammunition cache uh destroyed in the war what was going on in uh, May of June of 1970 was uh, the Vietnamization program. You know, we were getting out of Vietnam. We were withdrawing. So we had the Vietnamization program there. What President Nixon uh, wanted to do is to give the South Vietnamese a head start. So he allowed us to go into the sanctuary zones in like Cambodia and Laos uh, to to give them a head start. So we, we had a two-month window that we could go into Cambodia and just uh, destroy the stockpiles of ammunition, their base camps and everything. And so that, that started on May 1st, 1970. So uh, there was a, a, a loach, uh, light observation helicopter, paint part of a pink team, was going around on treetops. A pink team, what they do is their job is to draw enemy fire, mark mark the enemy fire, and then the red team, the Cobras would come in and attack the where they marked with white phosphorus. Well, they just they stacks of ammunition through the trees in the jungle, and so first cav assaulted the, the, that area. And uh, Charlie Company, second of the 12th, uh, Echo Company. So they they took over. And with with there was several loss of life. It wasn't an easy capture. Uh, and I don't remember exactly how many troop, troopers that they lost there. But uh, then called us in. And so there was over 320 tons of weapons and ammunition at the cache site. You know, everything from 
you know, some brand new one, uh, 122 rocket launchers uh, that uh, they had, they, they were the newer model. Uh, they had stockpiles of 85 millimeter fixed ammunition there. And, uh, and the only thing 85 millimeter ammunition can go into is the 85 millimeter field gun or the T the Russian T-34 tank but they were stockpiling that ammunition there. There was no artillery there, no 85 millimeter, there were no tanks that we found, but they had that, you know, they were getting ready to make the push into South Vietnam and, and Saigon, and they were just stockpiling everything there. So these cache sites were in a jungle along a trail and different stacks and stuff like that. And so we had to, we went in there and a lot of the uh, weapons and everything was, uh, was taken back hauled out of there. We actually only blew up 70 some tons, 70 some tons of weapons and ammunition, roughly used 300 cases of C4, uh, 40 pounds to a case, 12 cases of deck cord, 3000 feet to a case to wire, everything up and to connect everything so we had dual detonating cord lines that we buried yeah. uh because it, we were eventually going to withdraw from this uh, and to, when we blew it up and we knew that w there was that we had movement we you know detected movement out into the jungle they were doing probes and stuff like that uh want to take this cache site back right uh, so it took us about I trying to remember how many days it took us about five days to set it all up and, and, uh, get ready to blow. So everybody's been X filled out except for master Sergeant Mike land and myself were the only two EOD guys on the ground. And we had a small squad from, uh, echo recon second of the 12 as our security. So what we did is we planted, these perimeter charges around the helicopter HLZ. Uh, so as we would withdraw and, and after we exfilled, these charges would go off to keep the enemy out of there so that they wouldn't cut the fuse and retake the cash site back. So we had 10 priming systems, more than dual prime. We had 10 of them. Um, we we had some bad blasting caps too, the, the bad the numbers caps. and stuff like that. Yeah, so we had some problems with with duds with caps and stuff like that. And so we prime more than dual. We had ten priming systems because we weren't going back, and we had fifteen minutes each. And so the word came okay to Xville, so we popped the fuses, the M60 fuse igniters. And we run to the lead helicopter, which is the one that we were going to be getting onto. And this infantry captain is on a radio. And then he turns to us and hollers, cut the fuse, cut the fuse. You know, not asking any questions. Uh, we ran back to where the burning fuses were, took our crimpers, cut the fuses. And then he says, uh, you know, he tells us to light it, you know. And it's like, that was all of our fuse igniters. We, we used every fuse igniter. We had 10 priming system. And so we go there and we take our knives out and we take our C ration matches and we split the fuse and put the head of the match into a split fuse. And once you light that, it spits back a little bit. If you're quick, you can get a second light off the first one. So we're lighting. So we don't know what kind of time we have. And uh, the fuse is burning. The next thing we know is, uh, you know, our charges are going off. We were supposed to be gone, and our charges are going off that we had just, you know, blocks of C4 along the perimeter that we had also primed, uh, and they're going off. And uh, But you can see the helicopters, they don't know anything about these perimeter charges. They probably think we're getting mortared, and they're bouncing, they're ready to leave. So we run back to the helicopter, we jump in 
and then we're there and now we can't lift off the ground we're, and, we're and you don't know and you don't know how much time you have right and i think that's one of the key to we have no about. idea how much time because we just cut fuses you know I, we did we're, we're, we just reached in there and cut pulled so and the door gunner taps me on the shoulder and says you're going to have to get in the helicopter behind and he also two of the infantry guys so we jump out and we look they have the same problem they drop off a couple people and then these two helicopters just take off again you know, they just just you know these are huey helicopters uh and you're just standing and so there right? on the ground I, yeah, I'm going to cut fuses again. I I'm not going to be here when it goes off. So <laughs> I was going to cut fuses, but there was another helicopter and I don't know where he was. He was in orbit, empty in orbit. And he came down, picked us up and got us out of there. And I had to cam my camera with me and I did snap a few pictures of Rock Island East uh when it go and we we received some ground fire, but uh and so I took pictures of Rock Island East blowing up. And uh, yeah, years later, I actually uh, located that helicopter pilot. Really? And he's someplace out in the East Coast. And I have got his phone number and we talked and I thanked him for coming down and picking me up. Yeah, because you really didn't have, I mean, there's no good solution there, right? It's either uh, you get blown up in Rock Island East or you cut the fuse and you have the enemy come and take you, right? I mean, those those are like those are the those are the two options that you really have, uh, and so kind of a guardian yeah. angel out of the sky to come pick you up and, and get you out of there. It's a, yeah, yeah. It's that a, wasn't the only a, time I was left behind too. We were left behind another time. Uh, we uh, there was a special forces camp. And uh, they had abandoned the camp, and they blew up the bunkers when they abandoned this camp. And first, Cav decided to take it over. They renamed it Fire Support Base Snuffy. But so this, it used to be an old French outpost. There was a French old landing strip there. And then first Cav had, I mean, Special Forces had it. So first Cav, we did a combat assault uh, in with first Cav to this uh, camp that they wanted to reoccupy. So we were in, so Master Sergeant Land and myself were in the camp looking for booby traps, unexploded ordnance, and some of the bunkers did not blow up. Uh, there were still blocks of C4 and stuff that had not detonated. So we were clearing everything. So we spent the day just uh, clearing, going, clearing the camp while the first CAV guys did patrols in the prim on the perimeter. And uh, it was getting kind of late in the evening. And next thing we know is these helicopters are coming in and way down at the other end of this runway strip and picked up the first cab guys. And then they took off. And then we were just left there alone. Um, and it was getting dark. Um, and we thought, well, we're going to have to spend the night out here, you know, uh, no radio uh and we figured somebody eventually will miss us uh but they had gotten all the way back to Fook Vin and remembered somehow they remembered uh, they forgot the eod team so they combat assaulted back out and came in and picked us up but yeah i was thought it was going to be a long night that's a, <laughs> that's a it's it's craziness it it's does you know you did you did one tour in Vietnam, correct? So for eleven months, yeah. And then you eleven came, months, uh, and then you came back to the states, and you exited the military, correct? Yeah. Uh, so because I had less than six months left in my military obligation, uh, I got so I cut the, that one instead of a year in Vietnam. I did eleven months, and I could get discharged. You know, the war was winding down. They were given dis, you know, if you had less than six months and it wasn't worth for them to reassign you for four, five months, you know, someplace. So, yeah, I, I got out of the military. Uh, I left and um, got met my wife at the time, my first wife, and got married. 
uh, had a child. I, I worked in Michigan in Greenville, Michigan. So I worked in a factory. Uh, the factory had a contract with Ford and we made body parts for Ford. So I was, I was a press operator operating a 500 ton press. This is the largest press in the shop and stamp out body parts for Ford vehicles. Uh, and uh, I became, within a short time, I became the lead man on the largest press in the shop, 500 ton. But uh, I couldn't see myself, either, though it was good pay. It was one of the best paying jobs around. Uh, I just couldn't see doing 20 to 30 years factory work, you know. Uh, and actually, it was quite dangerous work. Um, uh, I had to go, I had to go several times to get stitches, to get cut on metal. Uh, I had, I had a piece of the die break off and hit me in the cheek and I had to go and get it removed, a piece of metal out from the inside of my mouth. I had broken a finger there, a piece of metal tipped over and on my hand. Uh, we had, we had a guy that a bunch of steel tipped over and his got his legs crushed. He had one guy got his hand in the press, lost his uh, arm in the press. Um, it, it was quite dangerous. I figured it would go back to EOD to be a little <laughs> bit safer. And so you, you came back into the army. Um, you were a, a sergeant in E5 when you left, correct? Yes, I was a, a, specialist. a specialist. Back then we had specialist ranks, so I was a specialist E5. Okay. Uh, EOD, EOD was you the hard stripe staff sergeant back then. In the early days, you know, you had the specialist ranks went all the way up to E9. Right. And But did they let you come uh, back as a, as a spec five when you came back into the Army? No. I came back as a PFC. Uh, so I saw the Army... Well, first of all, they weren't letting people come back into the military post Vietnam downsizing. Yeah. They weren't they weren't taking people. But the recruiter said to me, he says, you can come back into the army, but you got to come back as EOD. And I says, fantastic. I wouldn't uh, want to come back anything other than EOD. And uh, he said I had to lose two ranks. Now, I was out for two and a half years. So I, I lost two ranks. Had I been out for three years, I would have had to gone through basic training all over again. That was the requirement. But um, so I came, but I got my rank, you know, I made rank back pretty good. You know, here was a, I mean, here I am. And, you know, I went back in October 73. So, you know, E3, but Vietnam veteran, EOD tech, you know, uh, we had E6s in the unit that weren't Vietnam. Yeah. Vets. Uh, so I went back to Fort Leonard Wood. The recruiter said to me, he says, where, where would you want to go? And I says, I don't care. He says, how about Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri? And I says, never been there. Don't know nothing about Fort Leonard Wood. So I went to Fort Leonard Wood to the 63rd. We also had a control detachment at Fort Leonard Wood too at the time. And that was the 543rd. So, yeah. And, um, and, and of course that, then the year of 75, 76 was election year and where we were doing VIP support. So we were running all around the Midwest doing VIP supports. I even did a train VIP support, the first train since the Eisenhower administration. Uh, the, so uh, Gerald Ford wanted to do a train, one of those train stop things like they did in the old days, the presidents did in the old days. So the Secret Service had to break out the books on how to do a train thing. Of course, this was the tooth bicentennial year. So we had the Amtrak bicentennial train. So what we did is that uh, we had a train and a caboose, a train, an engine and a caboose. So I was, uh, had a friend, my partner was on the front end of the engine and I was on the caboose. And as we went down the tracks, we were checking the tracks. So we were in this train ahead of the procession. And then we had two trains, two engines that were behind us. And then behind that was the Spirit of 76 Amtrak train with Gerald Ford, President Ford. And then behind that train was a backup train in case something happened to the, 
the president's train. So we went from Niles, Michigan to Flint, Michigan. But every time we would go into town, into these little towns, and when they saw our engine, our caboose, I think they thought that it was the president because the band would start up and start playing as we'd go into town. People would be shouting and stuff. So I just waving, you know, and then as <laughs> soon as they saw that it was just uh, nobody, uh, the band would stop. And But it was kind of fun. Yeah, I mean, and so for, you know, a lot of people don't realize that EOD technicians provide VIP support. So the Secret Service doesn't have its own bomb squad, and therefore uh, the DOD picks up the slack. And it's it's one of the best mission sets that I think uh, we have that a lot of people are not aware that we have. So, you know, we're out there to to find any type of explosive device prior to the president or vice president, you know, being on the ground. Um, we have lost one EOD tech. Uh, while doing VIP support missions, Sergeant Major Ken Foster. Uh, and my understanding is you were there for that, correct? Yeah, I was with Ken Foster when he was killed. That was, um, oh gosh, September of 1976. Uh, we were at Quincy, Illinois. Senator Dole was coming into Quincy to talk to the people. Senator Dole, Bob Dole, was running as President Ford's uh, vice president. So President Ford was running for a re-election. So he was, Bob Dole was going to be speaking at the gymnasium at the high school. And so we, you know, we supported that. There was four of us from, we drove up from Fort Leonard Wood to Quincy, Illinois. Um, and Sergeant Major Ken Foster, he just made Sergeant Major. This was the, his last mission with our unit because he was heading to Germany to take over the control detachment in Germany. Germany would have been his final assignment and he would have retired out of the army from Germany. Uh, so this was basically his last mission with us and him, Ken Foster and I, we were the two man team working together. J.P. Smith and Rod and George Sledge were the other two guys working. So everything went fine. We did all the searching and all that. And so Jim, Jim and George and Jim stayed at the at the hotel while Ken and I went out to eat at a rest local restaurant. While we were at the restaurant, there was a series of explosions that you could hear. There was four explosions. So that happened while we were at the restaurant. They saw they sent a secret service team out with George and, and Jim and uh, to where the site of the explosions were with the sh local sheriff and everything. One was explosion at a bridge, three of them were at Colt Compressor Factory. Um, nothing, and there was no, never a, a call or anything that there was any connection with Senator Dole's visit there. Um, so everything went back to normal. Now, the next day we were at the airport, uh, and he, he had a charter aircraft. So we searched all the luggage, we searched the aircraft, and then a bomb threat came in somebody at the airport, uh, on sent against Senator Dole. The Secret Service said to us, what are we going to do about that? And we said, really nothing. We did our searches. We're confident in our searches. And so Senator Doe got on his aircraft and left. And basically we were cut from the Secret Service support at that time, soon as Senator Doe left. But the county sheriff wanted us to uh, go back in the daylight to where the bombings occurred, just to get our opinion of what we thought took place and just to look at the wreckage and everything. So as we were getting ready, changing out of our suits and going out to the thing, the fire department was searching the Colt compressor factory in the, the area, and they found an IED that did not go off. So the IED was in, these Colt compressor factory makes these compressors, they're huge compressors. The whole back end of an 18 wheeler is nothing but a compressor with sliding doors. So the, the fire department opened up the sliding door and there staring at, there was several sticks of dynamite, a six volt battery and a clock. 
and you can see it was a Kmart battery too. It was a Kmart brand battery. They took a picture of it, the fire department did, and then they took and slid the door closed. I don't know why they didn't leave it open, but they closed it. So when we got there at the gate of the factory, they told us they found an IED that didn't go off. The search was stopped. Uh, we saw the Polaroid picture of what it was, not a great picture. Uh, so Ken was going to go down for a recon. He was, and these truck trucks are parked side by side. So you have to walk in between these parked 18 wheelers uh, and then get there to a sliding door and open. You have to be right there. So Ken, he was going to do the recon. And that's all he said he was going to do is just go down there and, and take a look. And then we would figure out how we were going to tackle the IED. Right. The arson inspector for Illinois had arrived. He wanted to kind of go down there. So he followed Ken down between the trucks, but he stayed back a ways. Uh, and only Ken was there. And we could not see Ken. Nobody... It, so what had happened and the next thing i know there was an explosion metal going through this flying through the air the smoke and everything so the arson inspector stumbles out he his eardrums are ruptured he can't see george and jim grab him and lead him to safety i rushed down to where ken was and Ken was killed immediately during the explosion. Yeah. Uh, there was nothing I could do medically to sustain any life. It was He was in close contact. I believe based on the injuries that I saw on Ken's body that he decided that once he got down there and saw the clock and the screw and the hand, I think he thought he needed to do immediate action, that he needed to take care of this right now. And I do believe that he probably was trying to remove the blasting cap out of the dynamite. He had no wire cutters or anything like that. Right. So I think he was just trying to take that. It became an, you know, the clock mechanism became an anti-disturbance that probably a little bit of movement got final electrical contact and the device blew up and so but after it blew up the area was still not cleared safe they had stopped the search for any other ieds when they found this one so we had to the three of us had to continue searching the whole area to make sure it was clear then we brought the coroner in and i helped put ken's body in in a body bag and um and then we got a bomb, a bomb threat came in at the high school. So then we went, went over to the high school and evacuated the high school. And uh, we told uh, some of the workers that working staff there, the janitorial staff and some of the teachers, we told them to search the school, anything that looked weird, out of place, or just don't touch it, let us know about it. So they did a search of the school Nothing was found in the school. Um, also, then the, the 50th EOD at Granite City came up to relieve us. Um, we went to the coroner's uh, office. We picked up Ken's personal effects. And then three of us drove back to Fort, uh, Fort Leonard Woods. So we had four of us in the car on the way up. Three, there was only three of us driving back to Fort Leonard Wood. You know, it was... You know, it was just a tough time, tough time for the unit. Um, it, members of the unit and the unit families took the whole tragedy. It was, you know, but, you know, there was never anything offered to us, such as grief counseling, uh, you know, and, and uh, it was really a hard thing. Ken had several young children. Um, and uh, and uh, yeah, it was uh, it was it was tough. Yeah, no, I can imagine. Um, is that one of the things that that led you to become interested in being, you know, a medic? 
Yeah, I so I took EMT training. You know, I knew that there was nothing I could do. I had the red. I had taken the standard red car, right. cross course, uh, but I I decided to enroll in the EMT course at the local college there, Texas Co Community College. And so I took the EMT and I became registered state of Missouri and nationally registered as an EMT. And I thought, you know, I was thought I'd get out of EOD. You know, I wasn't getting out of EOD because of the job. It just, I, I wanted something different F, you know, I wanted something more. So I put in to be a special forces medic, you know, I put the paperwork in and I, I got approved and I had a class date and I was going to start up in October of 78, uh, go to go first, go to Fort Sam Houston, you know, go through the, at that time, the medic course was a 91 B today. 91 B is a vehicle wheel mechanic, pretty close. Uh, <laughs> But um, yeah, so I was going to do that and I was getting out of EOD. I thought, you know, I want to be more challenged. Peacetime EOD, I, you know, you know, going to the grenade range, you know, about four o'clock, we'll get a call saying that we got a dud grenade at the grenade range and go out and blow up the dud grenade and find out that while well, the pins are still in the grenade. Uh, so I was going to special forces. Well, the sergeant major at our control detachment knew I was leaving the EOD, knew, knew that, but he got word that they were forming a brand new unit up at Fort Bragg, and they were looking for EOD. They were looking for NCO, EOD NCOs, and if they had Vietnam experience, that was a plus, but uh, they were looking for six EOD, so they were tasked sending things out to the field, the EOD field. So he called me up and says, hey, Mike, they're forming this new unit at Fort Bragg, and I think you might be interested in it. So he gave me the telephone number. So I called, and they said, well, would you be coming? Would you come for an interview in two days? And I said, sure. So two days later, I flew to Fort Bragg, uh, went to now Camp, uh, Fort Liberty, went to the old stockade the, uh, there on Butner Road, and um, went in there and I interviewed with Colonel Charlie Beckwith and found out that this new unit, what this new unit was forming, you know, forming up and looking for six EOD. And they were looking for EOD port to be, be operators. Uh, Charlie Beckwith's vision of creating a counter terrorist unit was that MOS was immaterial. Uh, he wanted to open the unit up to any MOS. Now the first, you know, use the first few groups that we got were mostly special forces and Rangers uh, background, a lot of Vietnam, a lot of v wealth of Vietnam experience. Had two people that were on the uh, Sante mission, Jack Joplin and Dick Meadows. Um, but he believed that you needed a counter terrorist unit, you needed people of various backgrounds and skills to be blended. You know, if well, I need somebody to drive an 18 tractor tr wheel vehicle, or I need somebody to drive a bulldozer, or I need, you know, somebody to pretend that they're a chef or whatever, all these different skills, but he wanted the EOD people as operators and he wanted six. So, so OTC one was starting up there in the, uh, in, in 78. So I didn't go to, I didn't become a special forces medic. Uh, that was thrown out of the window. I was going to still be EOD, but I'm going to be in the unit. So we had five, five EOD guys in OTC one, the operator training course, and only Dennis Wolf and I made it through. And this is, this is right. backwards to the way it is now, right? Because you went through operator training course, but you yeah, had instead of selection, selection assessment. Yeah. Well, they Beckwith was in a hurry to get us on board, but with the understanding, we still had to pass selection and assessment. We st we had to we knew that, and of course we were all legs too. We also had to go to jump school. We all knew that too. Uh, so yeah, so 
we want so that but they were already they had already done the selection the 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 spring selection uh and for OTC1 and to, OTC2 so and there was five EOD guys in OTC2 only two of them made it through Irvin Banna and Bob Daly but now after OTC we had to go through selection and assessment so the fall selection assessment course in 1978 Back then, selection assessment was done in North Carolina, Uwari National Forest. And so the fall of 78 was the last, starting in the spring of 79, selection assessment now is in West Virginia. But back then it was in Uwari National Forest. So I went through with Dennis, the selection and assessment course, the first one in fall of 78. And Dennis made it through, and I did not make it through. I got pulled because my times. Selection assessment, you're carrying rucksack. As the time increases, your rucksack increases. You go from 45 pounds to 50 pounds to 55 pounds. You don't know how many, uh, how far you have to go, what your different RV lanes are. And they're using land nav by, by yourself as a means to do selection and assessment. And um, anyway, I got pulled, I had, to, I had to go see Colonel Beckwith and Colonel Beckwith says, if you wanna stay, you wanna stay here? And I says, yes, I do. And he says, well, you're gonna to have to go through, pass the selection assessment course. And you can try out for it several different times. Right. You know, if you get pulled for, you know, if you get injured, you get pulled for time. You can you can go. I know one guy hit, went through selection assessment course five times and made it on his fifth time. What is so, it like? Um, what's it like going through? Just to back up just a little bit. So going through the operator training course, you are with a group of people, the operators who have already been assessed and selected. Was there any type yeah. of like animosity, yes, you know, sir. between them between there them was. and you? They thought we were getting special treatment, but we still were understanding right. that we had to we had to pass it. Uh, there, there was no special favors being offered, Colonel. If you if anybody knew Colonel Beth with, he did not do you know. You it's just you had to do it. That's yeah. just plain it. You know he. He wasn't going to give you a special favor because you're EOD. Yeah, there was some things that we had not paid our dues. There was some animosity, a little bit of animosity. Um, but uh, in the beginning, yeah, that's true. But then then we had to go to jump school. Now, I went to jump school. I didn't go to Benning for jump school. I went to jump school at Fort Bragg. Uh, 7th Special Forces Group was actually running a jump school at Fort Bragg. So I went through the jump school there and, uh, yeah, it was, uh, yeah. It was, so it's a week of ground, basically a week of ground and tower training and then two and a half days, you know, making five jumps and that was jump qualified. And then later on, uh, they made it a requirement that all, all the operators had to be halo qualified to military free fall. So, uh, then I had to go through military free fall school. That was a, a requirement. Where so, was where was free fall at at the time? Well, we did free fall at uh, Fort Fort Bragg, uh, and uh, we did we went out to Las Vegas to do the the wind tunnel because we there was no wind tunnel. That was where they I think the only wind tunnel in the country was in Las Vegas. So. We went out to Las Vegas and uh, went through the wind tunnel. Now, of course, there's the wind tunnel there at Bragg. And now I guess there's a wind tunnel there at Rayford, too. Right. Uh, I, I just found that one out, but went through the wind tunnel stuff. And, and then we did some of our training out at Marana, out in um, north of uh, Tucson at Marana. Uh, some of the where we jumped in. But, uh, yeah. Yeah. So now, now you're uh, at a unit. Yuma's where. Yep, Yuma. Yuma now is now where it's all at. Um, and yep. so now you're, you know, you're a qualified operator. You're you're on a team, but you're also one of the first EOD technicians. You know, uh, you're, you're standing this up effectively as an EOD guy. 
And so, yeah, yeah you know, we, what is so? Yeah, we we had uh, so Irvin Banna was assigned to Ace. We had th- two squadrons at the time. Irvin Irvin Banna was assigned to A squadron. I was assigned to B squadron. Dennis Wolf was assigned to S and T selection and training. And um, but Beck was still wanted six EOD operators in the unit, but we weren't getting them. They weren't. Nobody was making it. So we we sent three special forces uh, guys, uh, you know, eight, 18 Charlies. We sent three 18 Charlies. It was at the time it was 12 Charlie, but later it became an 18 series so before the 18 series. But we had three E7 special forces engineer guys that volunteered to go to EOD school. It, it, as the rank of E7. So we made special arrangements with the EOD school to, uh, we made them E5s, pretend E5s, and uh, we sent them to EOD school with the understanding that they would not be awarded the MOS and that they would be not awarded the EOD badge. Now, the requirement back then to for the EOD badge was to be a permanent award you had to serve in the EOD unit for 18 months. Is it the same today? Uh, yes and no. So, you know, there's a grace period of 18 months where we where we say you're on a probation period for your badge. Um, but to my recollection, I can't think of anybody who's had their badge pulled in that 18 months, you know, uh, for for cost. They've, they've had them pulled for other reasons, um, you know, but within that first 18 month period. So, I mean, now the badge is a permanent award upon graduation. Well, we sent, the, so we sent the three guys to EOD school. Now, the instructors aren't stupid and they're like, this doesn't, they don't seem like regular E5s, you know? And uh, so a lot of instructors knew that something was going on. But uh, yeah, so we sent them to EOD school. And so they came back and they were our assistants. If we had an EOD problem, they would, they would support us. Like I had, uh, I had a, a IED in Honduras on an aircraft in Honduras. It was, aircraft was hijacked. I think this was 1984 with some Americans on it, it was de Havilland-7. So it's in the capital city of Honduras, Tegucigalpolis, however you say it. So we, f- I was in the advance f- party and I flew down to Honduras. And, uh, and anyway, they were negotiating what these, there was four terrorists that took over this aircraft and they had weapons, had handguns, they had what was claimed to be two IEDs on board the aircraft. And they wanted the release of prisoners that their fellow terrorists that are being held in jails in Honduras. Honduras said, Honduras don't not really negotiate. He <laughs> said, no way, we're not letting, we're not, we're not letting them out, you know. And uh Anyway, they then they wanted money, and this Honduran said, "No, we're not getting you any money." Now there was some people on board the aircraft that were from like some export company, you know. I I do believe maybe they did get some money from that, but so what they then wanted to do was go to Cuba, and they wanted a plane to Cuba. So they said, "Okay, we'll give you a plane to Cuba." But, you know, you got to leave all your explosives and stuff behind. And the, then once they 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 had the runway blocked off with vehicles and stuff like that, so they couldn't the aircraft couldn't depart. So um, they got them another aircraft to move the hostages to the aircraft. And of course, before they would open the runway up, they have to leave them. But anyway, they wanted to make sure that the terrorists left uh, their IEDs behind. So I was asked to go on board the aircraft and to verify that the terrorists left their IDs behind. So I go on board the aircraft and I see the first IED, which is up in the front right passenger seat. Uh, And it was a suicide device. They had planned, it was simple. It was dynamite, uh, nitroglycerin based dynamite, bad shape. Uh, 
it was so bad that even the terrorists were worried about it because it was exude because it was hot inside that aircraft so and exuding. the dynamite was exuding. So the terrorists even asked in the negotiations, what do they do with this dynamite? Because it's exuding. And I said to put it in a box with sawdust or kitty litter or something like that to reabsorb it. So the terrorists actually did that. Now, you know, and to make it easier for me to find it. But uh, in hindsight, I thought, well, you need, I should have said, well, you just need to get rid of that dynamite because it's, it now is very bad and dangerous. Yeah. But anyway, they, they put it in a box with sawdust in it. So I go on board and I find this IED and it's simple clothespins thing with a piece of cardboard. The guy had it sitting on his lap. And if we somebody would have assaulted the aircraft, they were just going to blow themselves and the aircraft up. And so I went to the, the other IED was supposed to be in the back of the aircraft. I went back there and I searched the aircraft, could not find it. So I could get out of the aircraft, call back to the Hondurans. And uh, this is, I only found one device. So they called and talked to the terrorists and terrorists said, well, we only had one device. We lied about having two devices. So I said, well, you know, if you can believe a terrorist. Uh, so, but then the Hondurans wouldn't let them go uh, until that IED on board that aircraft was taken care of. So I met, I met up with two Honduran bomb disposal. There are bomb disposal guys who couldn't speak any English. I had uh, Monto Santos, one of our guys, who's a Spanish speaker, uh, talk to them. And they, you know, I, says, uh, I says, do you want to take care of this device or you want me to take care of it? And they said that they wanted to take care of it. And I said, okay. I says, do you need any help from me? And they said, yes, they would like my help. So I took them on board the aircraft, showed them the device. And then I talked to them. I says, what, what, how are you going to attack this device? And now the, these guys have been trained here in the States. They were, they, they were actually trained by the CIA, these two guys. Uh, as, well, they were going to hit, want to hit it with a J-Rod, you know. They, they had the J-Rod there and as a disruptor. And they were going to, I says, you can't shoot this dynamite, the IED with dynamite with a J-Rod. Because I said, yeah, it will, it will detonate. You might as well just put an explosive charge on it and, and detonate it. So, But they wanted to use their J-Rod. And they, they were going to put on a bomb suit. You know, they're going to put... They're going to put on a bomb suit and to remove it out of the aircraft. And I said, no, that's not necessary. I'm, I've never put on a bomb suit. I've never had a bomb suit on. I've never operated or been around a, a wheelbarrow uh, robot. Uh, it's all hands on. I says, we're going to remove it remotely out of the aircraft. And so I showed them how to rig it up and do a remote removal with two lines and yep. set up the pulleys and stuff stuff like that so um we you know we taped up all the loose wires uh to make sure there would be never any contact and then we we actually removed it out of the aircraft and down into a ditch and because um, they were it was already in a, in a cradle and uh so and then once it was down there i says now you can i'll let you hit it with your j-rod so <laughs> they hit it with and it made sure that they just hit the batteries and not the dynamite. And so they did do that. And uh, then I made them split the explosives and to check for any secondary devices, you know, so it was, it was a teaching thing for them. You know, I could have took care of it in half the time, but uh, they, they were learning, but uh, the news got back to the agency that they, they uh, they attacked a an I dynamite ba you know commercial dynamite based IED with a, with the J rod they hit it with the J rod and so they were wondering like why were they allowed to do that you know and so when I went back to the agency I I did up my report and and I says your guys wanted to hit it in the airplane you know I just they wanted to use the tool pretty bad so. Um, 
you know, so I, I gave him the, the official report. I have the copy of the official report. That, that's but, awesome. Yeah. It's, it's a, but Frank it's, McKenna was my assistant it's during a, the whole operation. That's a pretty, it's a pretty awesome story. Um, you know, I posted the photo of you and we'll talk about, we'll talk about the meme here in a second. Right. But, you know, I posted that photo of you online last night on X Twitter. Uh, and I said, Hey, if you could ask this man one question, what would it be? And I said, you know, the good questions I'll, I'll, I'll ask him. Right. Uh, as of right now, it's been viewed, uh, 260,000 times, right? So over a quarter million views, uh, there's hundreds and hundreds of questions on here. Um, uh, so I'm going to cherry pick. So, so if you're watching or listening and it's not your question, you know, I do apologize, but, uh, if, if you're amenable to answering some of these questions, I'd love to ask you some. So let's see. Yes, go ahead. Yeah, absolutely. I'm, so I like one to is, answer questions. One is from a brand new soldier currently in AIT. Uh, and they said, what advice would you give to a brand new soldier, especially somebody who is entering into the intelligence community? Hmm. Well, there is a lot of good intelligence um, opportunities in the military, the different intelligence organizations. Um, and with some of them are, of course, because it's intelligence, uh, these are classified uh, units. Um, but there is, you know, to, and I've worked with several of these intelligence operatives uh, and and they they are out there they're out there preparing the battlefield for us, uh, and uh, I had one guy when I was in Jordan, an intelligence operative in one of these organizations, and he was my interpreter in Jordan, and uh, I tell you he helped me out tremendously. We would have to. This was after desert storm we had the the overwatch program you know the no fly supported in the no fly zone and stuff like that and so we were up against the uh, iraqi border and we were doing an exercise i was jsoc exercise sergeant major at the time and we'd have to go through these at this town of azrock we'd have to go through this checkpoints and um and uh Every day, it was a hassle going through the checkpoints. But one day when going through the checkpoints, the chief of police of the local town was talking to us. And um, anyway, he had a problem. He, 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 he did a, um, one of those UN um, peacekeeping things. And the UN actually owed him back pay. This is the chief of police there in this town of Jordan. And he's owed back pay. And he wanted to write a letter you know, saying that he wants this back pay. So my interpreter, this guy, helped him write, craft this letter so that he could uh, uh, get his back pay. And uh, boy, I tell you, we after that, we owned the town. <laughs> uh, uh, you know, you know, I've, I did some different, like I went into Sudan. I had... I was there was two of us from Delta that were with part of this intelligence team that went into Sudan in the 1981, 19 yeah, yeah. and um, and we did uh, at the request of the Sudanese government to our government, they wanted us to evaluate the security of the president of Sudan, so we went in to, we went in there to do that. The, the pal, you know, his places where he stays, his residence, the palace, uh, you know, the government house, all this other kind of motorcade. So I was part of a team that did evaluate the president of Sudan's security. And then I worked with the EOD, Sudanese EOD people. And um, it, they were trained by the British. The Sudanese had gone to British schools and uh, worked with them. And uh, so 
great, you know, did these were that these were with these intelligence group people that were oper- intelligence operatives. And uh, yeah, I had a str- of course at the time in in Sudan in Khartoum there was terrorists were planting bombs in in the city that they were from Chad. And they were pretty sophisticated IEDs, electronic timers and everything. And the, the Sudanese intelligence system people were, were, I was amazed by the Sudanese intelligence. The, and they intercepted these two suitcases at the airport there in Khartoum, big Samsonite type suitcases, went to a small, and I was there work observing them because I later went in and trained them. Uh, but I was at this time, I was just observing how they worked and they went into this room, opened up these two suitcases, lifted up the lid, and they were both jam packed full of Semtex H explosives, just full of Semtex H. And they just opened them up in this room there at the airport. And I'm like, you know, I says, if you intercept very many of these, the next time you go click, click and yeah. open, it's going to go it's off. Going to go. Yeah. So I taught them how to open the suitcases remotely and stuff. We brought in x-ray machines for them and everything. Uh, so I trained the, the Sudanese VIP team. And, but the, the, it was, I tell you the intelligence field, you know, it's not all behind the desk type sitting behind the desk, being an analyst, you can be right out there in the thick of the things. And like I say, uh, they prepare the battlefield. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, another another question. Um, you've obviously had a very storied career and life, but what is one thing that you wish you had done while in the military that you did not have a chance to do? Well, too bad they didn't have that mountain and ski team uh, <laughs> like they did in World War II, the tip, you know, Camp Hale just to the north of us. Um, Yeah, but I did get it. Climbing was, climbing has always been my passion. It's my escape mechanism. And whenever I had any weekend off or any time off, or I was on a trip, if there's a climbing opportunity, I took it. So I taught, besides being EOD, being an operator, an assaulter, uh, EOD, a breacher, uh, and became a master breacher, and I ran the the breaching R and D program for a number of years in in Delta. Uh, I taught rock climbing and mountaineering, and I went on rock climbing and mountaineering trips, and even cave and splunking trips. Like we did some caving in Poland, uh, vertical caves, technical caves. Uh, so I did get to do that climbing, uh, a lot of climbing. Uh, yeah, if I'm out at Nevada test site and was working out at Nevada test site, and it's a four day work work week out there, and uh, I would be at the Red Rocks on the weekends, you know, climbing. Yeah. Uh, and is there uh, yeah, is there uh, one school or anything you know that you that you never had a chance to go to that you wanted to or or anything like that, or did you pretty much do everything you wanted well, to do? Yeah, the only thing I didn't do is any scuba stuff, you know, diving stuff and. And I'm really, I thought I would like that. And, um, but, you know, I'm not too much fan, especially cold water. Uh, But scuba school would have been, would have been a nice school to to attend. My wife will laugh if she hears me say this because she hard to get me into the water. But, uh, yeah, I think scuba school would have been, you know, Key West. We did spend some time down in Key West. Uh, did a lot of uh, training down there in the Key West area. What a, this is a good one. Um, who was a leader in your career that you adopted an attribute from? And why was that attribute something that you found valuable to emulate? Well, my mentor, and it's good to have mentors. And as a senior leader, senior NCO or senior leader, that's your number one job is mentorship to me. 
And I, in Vietnam, I had the best mentor, Mike Land, is, is Richard Michael Land. He's several years ago, he did pass away from cancer. But he took me under his wing in Vietnam. I went on a lot of my EOD missions with him. I learned so much from him. He he wouldn't you he you he wouldn't make you do anything that he wouldn't do. Now, one of the things we had to do in Vietnam is um, we had to burn burn shit, burn our shit. Uh, we had uh, latrines. We had 55-gallon drums that we cut down. We had diesel fuel in them. And every so many days that when they would fill up, you would have to pull the drums out. Now, we had Vietnamese people that did that. But then once the Vietnamese were kicked off from the, the installation there in Vietnam, we had to burn our own, you know. And Mike Lance, Master Sergeant Mike Lance, uh, Labor Sergeant Major, he he burnt the first barrels. And then he says, okay, when you're on, you have the, on duty that day, that's your job is to burn, burn the shit. Yeah. And so he did it first and showed us how to do it. <laughs> well, that's what, a, that's what a mentor is. That's what a mentor and, should be. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's uh, yeah, it's like when I was on the aircraft carrier USS America, and we had, you know, I spent forty-four days off Haiti, and I on there, I was the senior enlisted advisor for the Joint Task Force during Operation Uphold Democracy, on an aircraft carrier, where we had uh, we had a whole Ranger battalion. We had what well, we had one sixtieth special uh, special operation aviation regiment as all our air helicopters on the aircraft carrier. Uh, the night this is 1994, and um, we had the Ranger Battalion. I had a Ranger Battalion on board the aircraft carrier. I had uh, two teams from SEAL, you know, two teams from SEAL Team Six on board the aircraft. I had a lot of all these people on on the aircraft carrier, and I was the senior enlisted ranking on there. So every day I would have meetings with the ship. Uh, with all the chiefs, section chiefs of the ship, and all the senior NCOs from all the different departments, uh, and uh, and try to, you know, we had to do the laund like laundry. So I would go down to the laundry room, and then I do, you know, see how the laundry's done. I would do the laundry. Uh, I would do every every task that we had to do on board the ship, like an aircraft crew would have to do. Uh, I needed to, 28 KPs to for 24 hours for all the ship's galleys on board the ship. The Rangers said that they would take the all the KP duties if I didn't assign them to any other duties. So I says, you got it. Um, now, so, now, the t ship was a no tobacco ship. Yeah. The captain of the ship can determine, all, I mean, the captain of the ship's got a lot of power. And they can determine that this ship is a non-tobacco ship. Well, we had a ranger battalion full of rangers that are dipping and chewing on board the ship. And uh, and what they were doing when we were on flight deck, with, when there's no flight operations, they were up on the flight deck and they were spitting in these uh, recess areas in, in the aircraft carrier called pad eyes. Pad eyes the area where, is where you secure all of the aircraft and all the handling gear for the aircraft. You chain them down in these pad eyes. Well, before you do a flight operation, you have to do a FOD walk, foreign object damage walk. You have to get on. So when they call for a FOD walk, all of those uh, people on deck have to form a line and do the FOD. Well, first time they called for a FOD walk, a lot of the guys on flight deck tried to escape. Uh, go below instead of take part in the FOD walk. So we had to correct that. Uh, and then we were going, you know, and of course you, the recess areas is where screws and nuts and bolts will go. So you have to check every pot pad eye. Well, these pad eyes were filled with tobacco spit and that did not go well with the ship with right. having to stick your fingers in there. And so 
I said that we could not stop the Rangers from dipping and chewing. It, it, this would not be a pleasant time on board the ship. So we we had an area that we set off back in the rear of the ship, the aircraft carrier, for the Rangers to spit and chew to their heart's content. That's always that's been always. I love Rick working with the Rangers and. Uh, and I, I love their enthusiasm. And when I was an exercise sergeant major, I was always the controller on the ranger target. Uh, and uh, but the spitting and the tobacco stuff is just a terrible. Yeah, I wish that would have never got started. Well, it's it's. I mean, it's still a thing. Uh, you know, <laughs> I, I don't think I don't think I think it's it's become a piece of American military tradition at this point. <laughs> Um, what, so the, this next question, uh, have you seen the movie, the Hurt Locker? Yeah, I did. And what is your take on the Hurt Locker? Oh, pretty, I do like, you get the sense, the feeling of what it is to actually walk down to an IED. I think that came across very good. But the most of the part of the, first of all, the personalities. To me, the, those the personalities of the characters that were in the movies, kind of a cowboy, you know, uh, those those personalities are the wrong type of personalities for EOD. Uh, person ain't gonna last very long with that kind of personality. I agree with that. Uh, it, you you don't you we never you never went anywhere without security you know right. um in in vietnam i you know we never you know, went we always had security sometimes i had uh, mountain yards were my security cidg civilian Irregular defense group mountain yards who didn't speak a word of english and and of course i didn't know any mountain yard and we would, you know, if we were set to work here, they would fan out in our security and they would disappear. And then when we got ready to move, we would just bring them on in and, and and good. But we always and they were great security. Mountain yards were the best security. Uh, but we always had security. You know, nobody's going to be watching us do any. Nobody's up there talking on a cell phone watching us. Uh, that would not be permitted. If, if they can see the IED, the IED can see them. Uh, uh, so you don't do anything without security. Um, you know, there was times that we traveled from base to base. Not you know, most of the time we did by helicopter, but there was times that we did travel by ground to go to a fire support base. Uh, and sometimes we had to travel in convoy, depending on the, what roads that we were on. But, you know, it's just, yeah, I, they could have done a better job. And I, I, I know with, you can't show anything that's classified, you know, the render safe procedures and and all the classified stuff. But it, it, I don't know. Um, they just I think, movie people. I, I think your opinion is in line with with most one, most EOD techs and, and most, you know, people in the military, I think there's a lot of concurrence on that, on the way you're feeling about that movie. Well, if you want to know what the best movie uh, series to see on um, bomb disposal is Danger UXB, the British film. Have you seen Danger UXB? I have. Clock 13 Stop part on. series. Yeah, I, I have. I need, yes. to re I need to rewatch it. It's been, it's been a minute. Unfortunately, I was part of the Hurt Locker generation, meaning I was in EOD school phase one when the movie came out to theater. So I was already in school, but all the instructors, you know, uh, would, would yell at us, you know, you're only here because of the hurt locker and that movie's terrible. And that's not what we're like. And I was like, I was in training before the movie even came out. Uh, I, one, one final question. Uh, how does it feel to be an internet legend? I mean, this photo of you has gone viral to the point where, People have no idea who you are or what you've done, 
but they can see the photo and like it's out there. I mean, everyone has seen this photo of you. And so like, how does it feel to be an internet legend? Well, to be memes started out as memes. And I'm like, how did this ever get started? And somebody just, but it just, the whole thing amazes me. I did, I haven't checked lately. I did this one interview, uh, Team House, I think Team House number 14 or whatever it was. Um, and uh, Jack Murphy with Jack Murphy. And um, last time I checked was over 200,000 views. It was a two hour interview. It just, it, it amazes me. I enjoy that people uh, want to hear this part of history. And I like to share this part of history because history is very important to me. You know, I do historical EOD research for the EOD Warrior Foundation. Right. Whenever they have a EOD history question, it's they funnel it to me. Or if somebody writes in and writing a book or or doing uh, try, a video or doing something, it's I get referred to that. Uh, Bob Leindecker is the historian for the National EOD Association. I'm this. I consider myself his assistant. Um, and preserving EOD history, and uh, I think it's very important. You know, I, I graduated in EOD school in May of 69, and, you know, EOD started, bomb disposal started in 42, so we're only talking about 20, 27 years from when I went through. So I still have a little connection with some of those, you know, uh, guys. When I first came into EOD, we had warrant EO, army EOD warrant officers, but they they soon retired out and did away with them. I think that I, the warrant officer program I think is is a great program that you can you have you can keep this institutional knowledge in with with the warrant officers. And I you know we have the Navy has warrants, the Marines have warrants. I wish that, you know, I, I do think the, there's a place for Army Warrant EOD in, in the EOD. Uh, yeah, it's been, it's for been, all that. It's been talked about coming back. We'll see if it ever comes to fruition. Um, yeah, we did. You know, when EOD first started out, bomb disposal first started out, um, it was not considered for the enlisted, it was not considered a career choice during World War II. Uh, when you went through, you know, the officers, you know, were taught, had, their training was more intense than the enlisted. The enlisted, we just, uh, in World War II, you know, rigging and uh, handling of equipment, care of the equipment, setting up tools, and recognizing ordinance, under, recognizing the hazards, but all RSP procedures were done by officers. So back then the, the, in the army, you were authorized that red bomb sh uh, shoulder sleeve insignia, or you could, depend on what uniform it goes on your pocket. But for officers during World War II, that was a permanent award. So when officers uh, transferred, say, went to a, out of a bomb disposal squad and went to a, an ammunition company, they still got to wear the red bomb patch. Enlisted, when you left the bomb disposal squad, it, you had to remove the patch. It was not considered a permanent award. You know, during World War II, we have photographs of all the officer classes that graduated. Don't have any photographs of the, there's no records of the enlisted graduates from World War II. Uh, Officers, we, and during World War II, we kept track of their assignments ever periodically. A list would come out saying where all the officers were assigned. Uh, and, um, and it was a little bit different. And of course, it wasn't until, you know, we, you know, we had our school, the Army had their school at Aberdeen Proving Grounds. And then we merged in about 1954, 55. Uh, we finally sent every, you know, fully incorporated in the EOD program there at Indian Head, Maryland. Right. The Navy was the proponent made with the proponent for EOD training. 
but uh, yeah, it was kind of different than in the early days. Yeah, there's there's definitely been uh, a lot of change, sir. I want to say, you know, one thank you so much for for taking the time to talk to me. Uh, thank you so much for everything you've done for the Army. Thank you for what you have done for EOD, and by the way, continue to do for EOD through the EOD Warrior Foundation, uh, through the you know Master Blaster Association, through being uh, our historian for our career field. Um, thank you. Uh, I mean that wholeheartedly from the bottom of my heart. I hope at some point I get to sit down and uh, in real life and shake your hand. Um, hopefully, yeah. you know, one of these years I get to bump into you here at the EOD Memorial uh, and ball. Yeah. Uh, you know, it, it'd be great to finally sit down and talk to you. Well, let's yeah, get I've you back, back down here EOD again. Memorial one time. Let's get you down here again. Yeah. Uh, hopefully there's an EOD Heritage Museum that's currently being constructed. Uh, and hopefully we can get you down here for the opening. I know you are. I know. And I'm, I am, I am working. (laughs) If you are listening right now or you are watching, please donate to help build the EOD uh, heritage museum here at Eglin air force base. So we can have literally that a, a place to gather, to talk about our heritage and our history as a community, sir. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, It is greatly appreciated. Have a great day. Well, thank you. 